history is sorely needed mm. nowadays. Mm. Did you take a bath this morning? Yes, I did. I did. We um, are <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to the Meetup, the Filipino Free Thinkers podcast that's also a video. I'm Red and I'm joined today by Leloy. Hi, hi Red. Welcome Masa. back. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to be back and I'm happy to catch up because we haven't caught up in a while. Nah, yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. So Leloy, in case you've been living under a rock, is a literature and history professor in De La Salle University, yes. Animal La Salle. Yeah, Animal La Salle, yeah. And congratulations, by the way. Early this year, you won the George McTavish Cahin? Cahin, Cahin yeah. Cahin, Cahin Price, yeah. Book Prize for Liberalism and the Post Colony Thinking the State in 20th Century Philippines. Wow, you, Whoa! Got, you got the full title right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I got yeah, it, I got okay. it. You should check out that. I, I don't have the book. Um, you should sorry, have told but... me I would have bought you a copy. Oh, okay, okay there. You signed. owe me okay. now okay. Uh, a signed copy. Yeah, there. I owe you. I will, th- this is the yeah. contract, okay. visual contract. But let's uh, get into it. History is sorely needed mm, nowadays. Mm, mm. Did you take a bath this morning? Yes, I did. I did. We are um, <laughs> fortunately because I went to the gym, so I had to take a bath afterwards. Yeah, we are very privileged in that sense. Uh, one could say that history is repeating itself. Oh my God! With the okay. water shortage, yeah, yeah. are the blackouts coming? Uh, like, um, of course, like when we were growing mm. up, that's that's when the rolling blackouts. So and yeah, the water I mean, the, those were my first political memories actually the 90s blackouts uh, in the Cory period so I remember growing up my grandparents or my parents would either be cursing Naralco or Gringo Nasan for the coups so that gives you an idea as to how old I am so let's look at this you have the superpower of knowing history this is <laughs> this is your life this is your work so it's like I did like 10 year challenges with my other guests okay. previously. But with you, with your superpower, we can do a hundred year challenge oh, even. Okay, okay. So how far? Like, what has changed? Hundred years of the Filipino, our identity. I know it's a tough question. Mm. I sort of, you know, brought it out of nowhere, but okay. what is it? Well, okay, hundred years. So a, a little bit more than a hundred years. My focus, is, as you told the audience, has been liberalism. Yeah. And, um, the argument I've been making recently is that the Philippine Republic or the Philippine nation was founded on the principles of liberalism. So, you know, people like Jose Rizal, yeah. these were not only liberals but also free thinkers. They actually Great. referred to themselves as uh, libre, libre pensa, libres pensadores, right? Yes. So, free thinkers. Uh, Volteriano was a, a, another term that's used and, of course, the, the famous Ilustrado. So, if you look at somebody like Jose Rizal, um, his biographer, Leon Maria Guerrero, said that he was actually a liberal first before he became a nationalist. What did Guerrero mean by that? He meant that um, he tried first to engineer liberal reform in the Philippines. In other words, a free press, freedom of religion, property rights. And when he realized that the Philippines was too reactionary because of friar domination at that time, he said, it's useless. We need to be an independent country. So in a sense, you know, liberalism was a prerequisite for his nationalism. So. Okay. So, so if you have people like that, you know, secularists and liberals founding the Philippine Republic, then you have to think about what, where we are right now, which is, which is quite, quite different, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so what, we, what we've done now is we've forgotten about this liberal heritage under Duterte. And in fact, you know, people can't agree what Duterte is for. We don't know. Um, I, populism, I, I, populism, for sure, right? killing, for one, yeah. mass murder, I yeah. guess. Um, but definitely everybody agrees that he's against uh, liberal democracy. Definitely. Right? So um, I remember there was this one time when the UN was trying to um, send rapporteurs to the Philippines. Um, and this was, the, uh, this was the time when you had the same person as his spokesperson. Abelia was the same person at the time. And Abelia said that the UN is imposing Western liberal standards on an Asian uh, collectivist society. And I thought that was so disingenuous well, because, number one, um, we were founded on liberalism. But number two, um, the UN rapporteur was sent by the U- United Nations Council on Human Rights. Prior to that, that institution was called the UN Commission on Human Rights. That UN Commission on Human Rights has a mechanism whereby anybody from any country may petition the commission, or now the council, to inspect human rights violations happening in any UN member country in the world. Now, that is the same system that is being used against Duterte, right? Yeah. Um, who engineered that system? 
Salvador P. Lopez, who was chair of the Commission on Human Rights in the 1960s. Wow. In fact, John, John, Hum, John Humphrey, who drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, called Lopez the most significant chair of the Commission on Human Rights in the UN, more significant than even Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow. Right? So a Filipino. A Filipino. He was prior to that he was Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Yeah. So when Abella and Duterte complained that these are foreign impositions on the Philippines, no, actually, uh, news news flash was developed largely by your own Department of Foreign Affairs, by your own DFA. Of course, the DFA is now run by an idiot. You know? Yeah. So we used to stand for human rights. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Universal Declaration of Human Rights was, of course, a response to Hitler, mm -hmm. and we have a precedent now, and yeah. his people mm -hmm. quoting Hitler, yeah. like saying things yeah. like "final yeah. solution" yeah. and all that. But if there's one thing that Duterte carried over from that history of Rizal, it's probably the anti-clericalism. Yes, yes. You know, yeah. that's that's something yeah. that that he has ratcheted mm. up mm. to a, to a different level. Yeah. Like he's telling people kill priests, yeah. you know, kill yeah. the bishops and stuff like yeah. that. So we have this new dynamic now, mm. like our two significant revolutions. Mm. Of course, uh, the, the first one was very anti-clerical, yes. and then Edsa mm. was. Like uh, a lot of people see the church then mm. as the heroes and not the enemies. Mm. And now Duterte is trying to mm. make the church the enemy. And a lot of people are trying to build the church up as mm. that hero again mm. to repeat what happened in Edsa and topple Duterte. Right, right. So that interesting dynamic is happening. But I have this thought mm. that Duterte is so mad at the, at the church. Mm. Like, let me know if I'm wrong here or yeah. if I'm stretching. Because there's sort of competition. Uh, for what? Right for maybe for the identity of the Philippines, mm -hmm. what it means to be a nationalist, mm -hmm. a Filipino. Does right. that predominantly right. Catholic right. Right. Yeah. identity mm -hmm. have to be there as part of the Filipino? Yeah. And maybe they've been doing the same things actually. Yeah. Like, um, and let, let me know yeah. if this is a stretch. The anti-woman sort of oh, rhetoric yeah. Yeah, yeah, is shared yeah. by both Duterte and the Catholic Church. Yeah. Anti-human rights as well mm -hmm. was there. Of course, not the basic human rights mm -hmm. of due process mm -hmm. and just not being arbitrarily killed, but Human rights was an issue with the church as mm. well. And anti-intellectualism, mm -hmm. anti-history, anti-science, anti-academy well, yeah. well, as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why it's so easy for Duterte to take down the church these days is because yeah. the church didn't do itself favors from like, uh, you know, during the Aquino period, this was the height of the RH struggle, yeah. right? And in a way, we did, we did a lot of work during the anti-RH struggle to discredit the CBCP. Yes. And uh, that's a that's a good thing. Um, yes. But uh, I'm a bit worried that all of that hard work that we did to discredit the CBCP, the person who's now cashing in on it is this madman in the palace. Yeah. So I actually, if I may ask you a question, how do you feel about that? You know, like we did all this work, man, and and like he's cashing in on it. I I forgot to mention yeah. during the intro, Leloy has a show. It's called Basagan yeah. Trip. Uh, it's an amazing uh, show. You should you. all check oh, it out. Okay. Uh, and he, he talks about many of the relevant topics. Mm, mm. And this is certainly okay. one trip that, uh, you know, when Duterte won, mm. people were looking at free thinkers and they were saying, hey, like, there's this secular mm. person who is now leading the country. You should get in on that. Right. You should, yeah. you should uh, join him. Uh, but we were like, no, <laughs> yes, of like, course not. He's yeah. okay. He's secular, yeah. but he's not rational. Mm. He's not scientific. He's not, you know, for human rights, which is which are many mm. of the values that we hold. So mm. definitely not. Yeah. So there were people saying that, you know, we we missed our chance mm. there. We could have been more relevant if we jumped on the Duterte oh, okay. bandwagon. Yeah, yeah. But you know, thankfully we did yeah. not sell out. Like we still have our mm. our morals. We don't want to go to hell. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, that's yeah. uh that's the thing and. We keep saying we, we want to contrast the way that we do our criticism mm. of the Catholic Church yeah. and anything that's against that free thought project. Mm. Th these are the ways we do it. We don't say kill the church, mm. uh, the church yeah. people, yeah. kill the priests, burn. We, we don't do that. Yeah. We attack their ideas, the mm. ones that are bad, but we don't go to the level of, you know, fear mongering yeah. or yeah. like uh, playing with people's emotions mm. to go against mm. your, your enemies. Mm. I think there need there there needs to be we need to say something about the, the of course the morality of the free thinker. Yeah. I think that's as a secularist, I don't necessarily necessarily shy away from the term morality. Yeah. Ethics definitely, definitely. and morality yeah. no, because um one of the things that one of the key texts that's been guiding me through this Duterte era has been 
um, Albert Camus' essay, The Crisis of Humanity. And there he quite, quite, says, quite, quite explicitly says that we should make a distinction between those who support mass murder and those who don't. And that's a distinction that needs to be made. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of people, because in the context of the Philippines, there's a political populism, but there's also an intellectual populism. The intellectual populism being saying that uh, anything that the masses think is correct must be correct because you're so afraid that you'll be called somebody who decries the Bobotante and that you'll be called an elitist, right? Yeah. So you go, oh, if they voted du for Duterte, they must, there must be a hidden, a hidden wisdom there, right? A lot of people do this. And yes. um, in academia, people do this as well. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about my anthropologist friends. Anthropologists love going deep into societies, going deep into communities, doing field work, absorbing the mentality of communities, and that's, very, that's all well and good, yeah. right? But I think that has a limit. Yeah. And the limit is when you start talking about somebody who promotes ma mass murder and his supporters. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, if you were plopped into uh, Nazi Germany or Weimar Germany in the 1930s, you would be able to find oppressed communities who supported Hitler. Yeah. And you would be able to have this, if you wanted to, have an effective understanding of where they were coming from, right? Yeah. But it would be more morally re reprehensible to do so. And I think we've gotten to that point when it comes to Rodrigo Duterte, that it is no longer the time to try to understand these people who support a mass murderer. It's yeah. very clear that mass murder is happening, so if they're still supporting him, they're morally liable. Um, and so we should make that distinction between those who support mass murder and those who don't. So I, I suggest, you know, to our viewers, watch that. You know, Viggo, Viggo Mortensen actually performs it. Um, it's called The Crisis of Humanity, Le Crise de Hume. I, I don't speak French, but he, it's, it's available on YouTube. Check it's, it out. It's, it's we'll we'll link to yeah. it. Like, we'll, we'll yeah. put the link here, but we'll put it in the description mm. as well. Check that out. Mm. Like, what you said about, like, giving people the benefit of mm. the doubt. I think that's a kind of problem with identity politics right. uh -huh. where you see people as either just a victim or just an oppressor right right so so that certain categories of people can only be victims and we should always listen mm. to them they will always be right and this is a, i think a problem of social media as mm. well mm. where you don't have too much time for nuance anymore mm. like people are used to these certain narratives or, mm. or stories mm. that to explain things will take lots of time. Mm. I'm sure you appreciate yeah. this as well. Yeah. Um, working with Rappler, even with your mm. shows, I see how how short you try to make uh. those episodes. You could certainly yeah. say a lot, yeah. Yeah. which is why I promised yeah. you this sprawling okay. Okay. broadcast to, to, to get into the details yeah. of it. And and that's the thing. Like You have to look at everything, every element of it, um, to see what's ethical, mm. what's moral, mm. and look at the, the bigger picture still. Mm. Like you said, that distinction it's not so hard, I think. Mass murder <laughs> yeah, versus yeah. not ma not mass it's murder. It's so easy now because the numbers, you see it. Eh, yeah, right? yeah. And everybody knows, if you look at the surveys, everybody knows that these are executions. Yeah. Right? I think the Pulse Asia survey said that around 70 to 80% of Filipinos we believe, know that these are extrajudicial yeah. killings. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you still support that, you're supporting it knowing that it's an execution. So the distinction is clear. Yeah. Kamu is right. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, you see, Filipinos say that they don't want extrajudicial yeah, killings yeah. to happen. But at the same time, they say that the, the drug war is something they support. Yeah, but yeah. an essential element of the drug war is the extrajudicial yeah, killings. Yeah. So I think people are not thinking consistently. Yes, yeah. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance, dissonance happening. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to think of themselves yeah. as the kind of people to support yeah. mass murder. Yeah. But they are. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is, the way we've laid out intellectual populism yeah. is if you critique that mentality, sasabihin sa'yo, ano sinasabi mo? May bobotante? Ganyan? Elitista ka, right? So, yeah. you know, the, the intellectual populism feeds into the kind of political populism that we see, right? Yeah. Um, so, so the question of bobotante, I mean, bobotante is a terrible term. It's an it elitist is. term, yes. yes. But that does not mean, just because it's an elitist term, that we should yeah. shy away from a cognitive analysis of voters. Because voters think. Yes. And we should be able to assess and the way voters think. And to want to assess mm. how they think is actually giving them, them more respect. Yes, yes, The yes, respect exactly. that they are due. And to disagree with them quite yeah. categorically is actually a form of respect as well. Yeah, it's um, not that kind of patronizing, mm, condescending, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, these, these voters mm. like know what's good for them mm. all the time. Like... It's really respect. It mm. comes down to respect. 
And we have uh, the, the our group as well been called elitist, you yeah. know, ivory tower. I'm sure you as an of academic, course, of course. Uh, uh, yeah. But at the same yeah. time, we are activists. We go out yeah, into yeah. the streets. Yeah, yeah. We we care about what happens. Mm. So, you know, like mm. they take that for what it's worth. Yeah. But we have to have these conversations mm. and not. Uh, it comes back to that that social media that you've oh, taken okay. a hiatus yes, yes, from, yeah. by the way. Like people like to talk fast. Mm. People like to make shortcuts. Mm. So these terms, bobotante, is a shortcut. Mm. Uh, the term elitist to shut down conversations yes, yes, is a shortcut. Yes, yes. Like gone are the days when we can have honest conversations, mm. civil conversations yeah. with people and have the actual chance at yeah. changing someone's mind yeah. instead of coming into a conversation and thinking, no, my yeah, mind is yeah, not yeah. ever going to be changed. I'm going to try to change your mind, if yeah. anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I, I, I dropped the, the category Marxist to describe myself. I mean... Maybe I described myself that way maybe 10, 15 years ago, but I haven't used that category to describe myself for the simple reason that I think, you know, a Marxist assumes a default position in a conversation. So if it's a conversation between somebody from the upper class and somebody from the lower class, yeah. the default position is that the person from the lower class is correct. But I don't like any predetermined criteria. Yeah. Of course, the Marxists are going to start trolling me and say, you know, it's more complex than that, but yeah. really. You, you got know? into uh, uh, yeah, yeah. interesting arguments yeah, yeah, on yeah, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. That's something you've taken a break from. Yeah, that's something yeah. I've taken a break from. <laughs> so, so, like, you know, when my book, for example, um, I, I, I write about ideas coming from scholar bureaucrats. They're not necessi- Some of them were quite rich. Yeah. Some of them were just very intelligent people who occupied positions of power. And I kind of make the argument that just because they're in that position, that doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to them. Um, and, and, you know, I hate, I've gotten good reviews. When you write a book, you, you get good reviews, you get bad reviews. But the bad reviews, there, are, there have been some very intelligent bad reviews. Like the one in okay. Philippine Studies um, by Dominic C. completely panned me, but in an intelligent way. Okay, So I'm very happy with that review because it was intelligent. It hated the book, but it was intelligent, so that's fine. But there were some reviews that were, were simply... That simply assess the book as, hey, it talks about the perspectives of elites, and therefore it is not as relevant as your first book where you talked about farmers. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, no, um, you just that's that's the laziest critique you'll ever see. Like, so so look at the ideas as they emerge and yeah. assess those ideas. Yeah. If you dis- disagree with them, then you can pan them, yeah. but don't kind of make take this default position that elite yeah. that, that elite perspectives are automatically less uh, viable. And um, so, so I think that's that's partly populism. Yeah. So intellectual pop again, this this idea of mine recently that intellectual populism feeds into political populism. Yeah. Again, the worst of identity mm. politics mm. is that you know one can always be just the oppressor. Mm. One can always be just the oppressed. Mm. Certain voices are automatically more valid and yes. correct just yeah. because they yeah. have certain yeah. identities belong to certain categories. Right. Right. And I think it's kind of the. The backlash of populism is partly because of this liberal authoritarianism that's mm. happening. You know, uh, we talked about Jonathan Haidt's, you know, right. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, oh. you know, all the political correctness that's mm. happening. Mm. And of course, there's, there's a backlash yeah. against yeah. that. And I think it's, it's really the, the lack of having conversations mm. now. Like people just want to jump on sides, yeah, to yeah, to pick yeah, their tribes yeah. and fight endlessly for that uh, side yeah. and forget the humanity on the other. Mm, and mm. unfortunately, this benefits the populace more. Mm. I think you know we can talk all day about who's right or who's wrong, but having this extremely polarized situation yeah, yeah, in our country yeah. benefits the dictator yeah, more. Yeah. So that's the problem. Yeah, because the the liberal, at least in the words of Salvador Lopez, I go back to him, is somebody who's always unsure. So it's uncertainty, you know, yeah. uncertainty animates liberalism. And you see it even in Rizal, right? Yeah. Sometimes he likes the idea of revolution, sometimes he doesn't, right? Yeah. Sometimes he's a Catholic, sometimes he isn't. So so that confusion is the centrality of liberalism. And I think that's that's confusion is something we should celebrate. Nobody yeah. celebrates yeah. confusion anymore. People want to be sure. Yes. And I think the strongest people, yeah. um, you know, when you look at Machiavelli, for example, he had this concept in The Prince, but also in the discourses on Libby called Virtu, which is a kind of virtuosity that comes from a place of security. So virtuosity meaning you can play this key, you can play that key. Yeah. It's actually a form of uncertainty, but yeah. virtuosity is virtue, virtu, comes from a place of security that I can throw myself out there, not be sure about what the results are, and yet still come out, um, you know, decent on yeah. the other end, right? Yeah. So 
people have lost that kind of virtuosity. They they feel like if if they if they can't take a side, if they can't be sure, yeah. then they th- then they'll back off from something. So it, um, it it relates to the the deplatforming that's that's going on in universities, yeah. where certain arguments can no longer be made, okay. so certain questions yeah. can no longer be asked. Mm. It's like people want certainty now, right? Like uh, um, for a very long time. The, this uncertainty, this marketplace of ideas, this freedom of speech has benefited the people who are being oppressed. Mm, mm. But now that the people who are being yeah. oppressed, their, their viewpoints have been validated, yeah. they no longer want this mm. kind of um, space yeah. to talk about things, to question things. And that's, that's a troubling yeah. thing. That's, a, that's the more nuanced thing that, you know, yeah. it's, it's more valid if you're on one side, mm-hmm. on the other, on that. But like you said earlier, the being supporting of, oh. supportive of a mass murder yeah. and not. Yeah. That's the easier yeah. Yeah. call to make, I think. Mm, there, are, there are easier. But, yeah. you know, the term marketplace of ideas, which you mentioned, yeah. is a very telling term, actually. It comes from Oliver Wendell Holmes. And it has actually a Darwinian heritage. I don't know if you knew that. Because uh, Holmes was reading a lot of Darwin at the time, and the idea of Darwin, of course, was that you have various uncertainties, and from the various uncertainties, you get a kind of uh, adaptation, right? Yeah. And he actually viewed the truth the same way. So you get various uncertain truths, but eventually, if you throw those truth, truths around, then you come up with a kind of meme or an yeah. adaptation. So you know, he, so so Holmes is interesting because yeah. he actually thought about free speech not in terms of uh, inalienable rights. Yeah. He thought about free speech as allowing for the truth, the truth yeah. to emerge out of a mean of various truths that you throw around. So it was both statistical thinking and Darwinian thinking informing yeah. that kind of those kinds of ideas yeah. in the late nineteenth century. You know, like as people who appreciate the Enlightenment uh-huh. project and mm. and all that, that, that's all well and good, mm. right? But truth in this day and age, in twentieth century mm. Philippines, let's, mm. let's talk mm. a bit about that yeah. because. Social media, you know, okay. you are a historian. I will take your word like 99.9% okay. of the time Thank over you. some sort of influencer. Ah, yeah, yeah. You talk about this on your mm-hmm. show as mm-hmm. well, right? Like, how does that make you feel? You put in the hard work, yeah. like reading the literature, uh-huh. doing the research, and then someone comes along just because they have 5 million or uh-huh. however million many followers, they, they make a more, uh, a bigger impact. Yes. They are, Believe more. How so, does that you make know, you feel? I mean, I've been critiquing social media for years. And in fact, I think that the Duterte, we, everybody knows this, the, the, the Duterte phenomenon has been enabled by insecure social media stars, right? That's part of the charm of, <laughs> that's part of the charm of Dutertismo. That's why they hate the mainstream so much. Because they're not smart enough to make it to the mainstream. Then they found this guy who suddenly enables fringe ideas yeah. and who makes them popular through Facebook. Not only does he empower fringe ideas, he gives them bot followers to boot. Some of them real, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. But so it's like all these people who, who are really broken people, who have no, no virtu, no virtu, <laughs> are suddenly ushered into the limelight. Okay. And, and when, 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 when you have that kind of personality, essentially yeah. vain personalities or fundamentally insecure, they're not going to say things because they're true. They, they're going to say things because they get followers, they get likes, yeah. and they get affirmation. And I think, you know, people like Martin Andanar know this. They know this. Yeah. So, so all they need to, so, so a lot of people early on were saying, oh, the social media celebrities, Bayaran. Maybe some of them got paid, yeah. but that's not the real reward. I think they would continue doing it even if they didn't get paid because the real reward are these kind of psychic rewards yeah. that they get from these likes and, and, and things like that. So, you know, I hate that system. I absolutely yeah. hate that system. But for the longest time, I realized that I was also partially feeding into that system. Yeah. You know, I enjoyed my likes. I enjoyed posting. And then, you know, I'd take time so I wouldn't post and I'd start to think. Um, and I've kind of, now I'm taking that critique to its logical conclusion, which is to quit Facebook. So my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram, they're all deactivated at this point. So I'm taking a one-month detox as per the recommendation of Cal Newport. Um, yeah. He's wrote two interesting books about productivity and digital distraction. One is Deep Work. Deep Work, right? Yeah, yeah the other one, one is, I read. The new one is uh, Digital Minimalism. So yeah. his ideas are, he's like the Marie Kondo of technology. Like, you know, look at it. Does it give you pleasure? If that, uh, Does it give you satisfaction? Spark joy, right? Spark joy, whatever. Yeah. If not, then, then throw it away. So I'm kind of doing a con Marie of my digital life. Um, and, it's, it's, and it's been good. And 
I think at the end of this 30 day digital detox, the most I'll do, the most I'll, I'm, I'm likely just gonna quit Facebook. But yeah. if I do stay on, I'll probably just check it one hour every Saturday, something like that. So I don't know yet. Like, but, I have two more weeks to go in this digital detox to figure out exactly how I wanna treat technology in my life. But your stall in that marketplace, uh -huh. that Facebook marketplace, would, would be shut down. And people yeah. would argue that. Oh, who will say the true things now? Who will correct the people who are trying to revise history for Marcos now? Uh, well, not me. <laughs> um, yeah. I, kudos to the people who are doing it. I still think that there, that there is a utility in terms of having people there in social media networks um, debating and presenting the truth yeah. amidst these alternative facts. But um, maybe that's not my job. Yeah, maybe my job to is be. to yeah. Maybe my job is to produce scholarly work um, and columns, yeah. which can then be appropriated by social media warriors on yeah. our side. So it's about utility. I uh, I'm not useful that way. I'm more useful putting in the research and um, doing the research requires. Uh, I think you know what Cal Newport calls yeah, yeah. deep work, right? So I need to do the deep work. I need to look at the documents. I need to spend three hours working on 1,000 words. Um, I think my utility, I think I'm more useful that way. Yes, mm. so you are an academic mm. and your, your special skills are of oh. course producing that kind yeah. of scholarly work and not like getting into the, the thick of things mm. and replying to yeah. the trolls and yeah. mining the- I used the... to, I used to. Actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so now there's one person, he's, a, he's another fan, mm. another future guest in this mm. podcast. He's Richard Haydarian. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And the upcoming debate between him and, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure you heard about this because you're not on, uh, yeah, yeah. You're not on Facebook. Oh, anymore. Richard's going to debate someone. Okay. Yeah, he's going to debate SAS. Ah, he's going to eat sass up a lot. I know, I, I know, but yeah. what do you think of that project? Like, do you think, like a lot of people are saying, don't even give them a platform, mm -hmm. don't, don't mm -hmm. make them think that mm -hmm. they're on the same level as you, you're yeah. an academic, yeah. you're a yeah. scholar, and then these people are, as, in, in your words, insecure <laughs> social media. I'm not talking about okay, sass in not, particular. Not sass but, in particular, but, but, yeah, what do you think about that? Uh, you yeah, know, I like, I, I just heard it now, so I'm just I have to post my response. <laughs> would you um, get into some? Oh, no, well, no, no, no. Personally, okay. I would not do it. I would not do it. Um, you know, Richard's a very influential person. Yes. I mean, he is. You know, he's the first Filipino to to write for Foreign Affairs since Nino Aquino. That's a big deal. You know? That's a big deal. Yeah, just for for SAS side. Yeah. It bolsters the argument that SAS is a legit intellectual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she's going to be on the same level. Yeah. They even released a joint statement. Yeah. And it was a very good joint statement. It talked about the importance of civility, yeah. of having conversations instead of just attacking yeah, the other side. Yeah. And I support that project. But what do you think as an academic? Um, yeah, I, I think what, Sass is yeah. somebody who supports mass murder. So once you phrase it that way, then the terms of the engagement change. I don't engage people who support mass murder. I just say they're wrong. Yeah. Um, so I've gotten to that point, right? It's, so it's like, you know, I don't think these people are as bad as Goebbels. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. I, have a par I have a particular yeah, threshold. Yeah. And then, you know, Duterte supporters are here. Uh, the <laughs> Nazi, the yeah. Nazis are there, right? But, but the Duterte supporters have definitely crossed that threshold. And beyond that threshold, I, I stop the debate and I, I take on, you know, a Jer uh, the position of of, uh, of a Jeremiah and somebody who says that there's something immoral in society, that, that kind of prophetic position yeah. or oh, religious <laughs> religious okay. solution. Ba there. Back uh, to the yeah. back to the religion thing. Uh -huh. And since you mentioned neo Nazis, yeah. let's talk about Trump for a bit. Okay. Uh -huh. Like I have a hypothetical question mm. for you. If Trump were our populist, mm. do you think that the Catholic Church would be against him? Well. I don't know if the Bible Belt is in any indicator. Maybe yeah. not, right? Um, yeah. And I remember, you know, um, when Trump first nominated Brett Kavanaugh, yeah. all of the liberals were complaining about it, obviously. Yes, of course. There was, but prior to the accusations of sexual assault, there was one wing of liberal America that actually supported Kavanaugh, and that, were, that, was, that was the Jesuits. So I looked at the... The Jesuits. Yeah. I, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in the context of America today, you would consider the Jesuits part of liberal America. Yeah. Uh, save that what you will, okay? Yeah. But they are part of liberal America. And I looked at their statement, and they actually, uh, one of the magazines of the Jesuits, uh, the leading Jesuit magazine, I think it's called, 
America, if I'm not mistaken. They outright supported Brett Kavanaugh because he was critical of Roe versus Wade. So there it is. Yeah, didn't there you matter. Have it. Yeah. Didn't matter that this person was probably going to support voter suppression. Yeah. Didn't matter that this person's probably going to empower corporations even more to hijack the uh, American electoral system. Yeah. It was a one issue. It was a one issue. It was. It turned on that issue of Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Um, then of course they 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 withdrew their support when they found out about the accusations of sexual harassment. Nevertheless, right? Yeah. They were supporting a Trump nominee. Yeah. And I think that's unconscionable. It was unconscionable, actually. So, I mean, if that's any indicator, then maybe you would have some support for Trump because of the anti-abortion position, yeah. the kind of socially conservative yeah. positions that he's forwarding, which he doesn't really believe in anyway, but he knows yeah. it's resonant he's, with he's, his He's base. kind of like a Soto, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In that sense, he just uses that conservatism mm -hmm. in a very pragmatic yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, the guy used yeah. to be a Democrat. Trump and he used yeah. to actually you know, fund, fund Planned Parenthood yeah, yeah. for abortion. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he's like okay, never mind. But so yeah, okay. uh, back to the Philippines. Like that 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 question. You know, when I thought about that question, mm -hmm. it it makes me wonder now about this wanting to champion the Catholic Church as that hero that's mm -hmm. needed to topple Duterte. A lot of people have told me, you know, don't be too critical of the mm. church. We need them on our mm. side. And I appreciate that. Mm. Of course, anything that we can do to, to hasten mm. that, uh, loss of support for Duterte mm. could be a good mm. thing. But at the same time, the Catholic Church's power, if, if you bolster them, if they come out as the heroes mm. in this particular saga of our history, how hard will divorce be yeah. to pass? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, yeah, we already know how that ends up. Yeah. And that's the story of Edsa. Yeah. Right? Because there if you, you look at, history you look at, repeating, yeah. Yeah, if you look at EDSA, for most of the 1970s, most of the 1980s, Catholic Church was not in the picture. Then they show up, Johnny come lately, 86, Cardinal Sin calls for the revolution, the revolution wins, and suddenly the revolution is a Christian revolution. I mean, just look at the EDSA shrine. Yeah. They claimed it by putting up a shrine of the Virgin Mary in the middle of EDSA. Essentially saying that without us, it, it was their way of That's saying the, that without yeah. us, this Certainly. wouldn't have happened. We restored yeah. democracy, yeah. right? And of course, you know, that had real political effects. Definitely. Particular Definitely. Cory Aquino being very beholden to them. Yes. Right? So, and, and the constitution, and having the constitution, that provision yeah, of yeah. equal protection for the unborn. Well, and essentially, stuff. bayad utang for the service that the Catholic Church made. So, my new one's position here is thank you, Cardinal Sin. That yeah. was a heroic thing. I yeah. mean, we should write in the history books that Edsa would not have happened without Cardinal Sin, and that was good. This was this was a this is a great moment for the church. But at the same time, we should acknowledge that some of the effects of that influence have been very deleterious for our society. And Definitely. so so we, we have how do we learn from that in the context of today? That's um, that's something that's, you answer. That's the that's the interesting <laughs> so we can be pragmatic about it. I think, you know, there are really important people there whom I respect and whom I really like. Yeah. Um, you know, I've worked a lot with Brother Armin Luistro and his positions on EJK are, are, are amazing, very categorical. I haven't met Bishop Ambo David, but it looks like if he were to take over the Philippine Catholic Church, then it would be bolder than the positions that people like Bishop Tagle have been taking. You, you, you say know? bolder there, and uh, I just wanted to, to bring mm. up that as someone who fought during the, the RH, mm bill yeah. uh, battles between mm. the Catholic Church and the progressive people, they're not fighting as hard now against yeah, the AJKs know, as they I were. Know. Like, tell them about uh, that. When right. you, when um, talk well, it, it depends. I yeah. think it depends who you're talking about. So, yeah. I mean, you look at somebody like Bishop Ambo David. Then yeah, of course he's definitely, he's, he's um, definitely a strong doing his adult, all, right? doing yeah. his all. Um, Tagle is a disappointment. It's really a big disappointment. Um, and I really hope, you know, I've heard rumors that he's going to be sent to Rome. And that somebody else is going to take over the Philippine Catholic Church. I do hope that happens because we need more from this guy. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, Tagli has always been wishy-washy. Even during the RH debates, he wasn't the most militant guy yeah. Yeah. out there. And I, yeah. I think at that time, we appreciate okay. the fact that he yes, wasn't definitely. the most militant guy. But now, it's a bit problematic because the guy's not saying anything about mass murder. It's, it's yeah. you know... That's, it could that's be a, galvanizing their yeah. side. It's, a, it's, a per, it's going to be a, a permanent more. blemish on his record, I think. Yeah, so... Like another question yeah. then, like you, you mentioned the, the consequences. Mm. Oh, sorry, so, sorry. Can, yeah. I, can I just backtrack a little sure, bit? Sure, you know, definitely. one of my favorite free thinkers in the history of 
20th century historiography is Tony Judd. So he's my favorite historian. And you should, uh, everybody should read this essay in his book, Reappraisals. And he has there actually a glowing endorsement of John Paul II. It's a very bizarre article because bizarre. He's, like, yeah. Yeah, he's a secularist like us. Yeah. But he loves John Paul II. And, and, and the reason he says that is because John Paul II, um, apart from, you know, of course, he critiques the socially conservative policy, but this is the guy who took down communism in Poland. This is the guy who empowered solidarity. And for that, he's perennially yeah. thankful yeah. for the guy. So that kind of measured approach to the Catholic Church that Tony Judd does with the, John Paul II, maybe we can appropriate some of that rhetoric yeah. when, we, when we talk about our bishops here in the Philippines. Yeah. And uh, yeah, mm. that nuance is, is very mm. important. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of people are just uh, just saying... Don't bring up the fact yeah. that the child abuse, even non-abuse oh, and non-rape oh, yeah, things yeah. Are, are going on around the mm. world. But the Philippines is sort of shielded from that because yeah. we need their support now as we topple our dictator. Yeah, but no, so, we do, no, no, we need to talk about it because we're, yeah. we've just, you know, Aris Rufo had a book. Yes. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Book. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at what happened in Boston, yeah. it's like... The iceberg runs very deep, and I wouldn't be surprised if if somebody, if, if another investigative journalist of Aris Rufo's skills yeah. tried to revisit the issue. I mean, you would that, have something like that. As yeah, well. you would have something like what happened in Boston, definitely. You brought about you you brought up movies, and I was thinking about you know ways to popularize mm. history and for for a bigger yeah, audience. Yeah. What do you think of the the two recent history uh, movies that came out, General Luna? Uh, and Goyo, as someone who knows the, the yeah. facts. And uh, I mean, yeah, um, you know, Gerald knows this, but we, we, yeah. we had a big debate on social media, but also, which is not going to happen anymore because we're <laughs> not on social media. But also, um, a m- more considered replies to each other on Esquire, actually. Yeah. So if you want to know what I think about General Luna, you'll see it there. Check but it I'm out. actually a big critic of the kind of historiography forwarded in General Luna. I have not seen Goyo. Um, I haven't found It's the on time. Netflix yeah. now. Check yeah, it but out. <laughs> General Luna, I maintain, is a very problematic movie because it did, I, I mean, it did empower Dutertismo. I yes, mean, I agree. very categorical I about agree. that. I mean, Gerald, it's not Gerald's, it wasn't Gerald's intention. Yeah. Um, I don't think he voted for Duterte. I no. don't think he even likes Duterte. But the kind of rhetoric in that movie is very du- du- Dutertian. Why? Because it was essentially this strong man who was p- pissing on if it anti-nationalist liberals. Um, so these were the people like Ben Camino, these are the people like Pardo de Tavera, who collaborated with the Americans. Now, we need to deal with the fact that people who collaborated with the Americans are not as bad as nationalist historiography has made it seem. Why? Well, you know, by that time, close to like 500,000 people had already died. So if you wanted an armistice, you shouldn't be blamed for it because you wanted to end the war, right? You wanted to end the killing. Yeah. And, and then the other thing was, these people believed, and you can call them naive for it, they believed that um, they wanted liberal reform. They couldn't get it with the Spaniards. Some of them believed that they would be able to get that liberal reform with the United States. And that belief was naive, but it wasn't completely naive. So look at somebody like T.H. Uh, Pirate Tavera. Why was he anti-Spanish? He was anti-Spanish largely because the Spaniards did not want to promote secular education. Why did he collaborate with the Americans? Because the Americans were going to build a secular university that would teach English, the University of the Philippines. Um, was that collaboration fruitful? Um, was that, well, the first question, was that collaboration unethical? Possibly. Was it traitorous? Possibly. I'm not sure. I'll leave, I'll leave it up to the viewers to decide. But was it bereft of fruits? No, because Pardo de Tavera then went on to become the founder of the Pensionado program under the University of the Philippines system. And, and, and that created the next generation of secular inte- intellectuals in the Philippines. And it's that entire tradition that is, uh, is, is brushed aside by the General Luna film. That, yeah. that in, entire secularist tradition, if I may add, because yeah. a lot of these people were actually secularists. Yeah, mm. so you have that. And somebody will will see this and then disagree with you yeah. because they saw the movie. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you that's know, the power of, of movies. There and, is one yeah. antidote to uh, no, to General Luna, and uh, it's the book that inspired my book. It's called Brains of the Nation by Rizil Mojares. It's the one history book that everybody should read, as far as I'm concerned. That's a recommendation right there. Yeah, Check it's that out. it's if you're gonna read about 19th century Philippine. Uh, nationalism. That's the only book you should read as far as I'm concerned. It is the most important book. As far as I'm concerned, most important book in Philippine history, period. I, in fact, just write 
we say Mohara's fan fiction. So why don't you just read the real thing? <laughs> okay, uh, check check that out. Check mm, that book out. Yeah. And um, Antidote to Henra Luna. Yes. Many people say that Goyo was his attempt at an yeah, antidote self -correction, to, yeah. mm. to Henra Luna. I haven't Luna. seen so it. I, I look should. forward to your opinion on that. I should, yeah. Uh, and I look forward... I was, I was going to watch it last yeah. night. Except I, I, I ended up finishing... Uh, Titans. <laughs> Not a good show, dude. Oh, oh man. Uh, we, we will talk about okay, recommendations okay. after okay. this. But Leloy, thank you so much thank for you, your you, time. You, I you. really enjoyed that mm -hmm. conversation. Check out um, his show on Rappler. It's called Basaganang Trip. It is very good. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to everyone who's watching this. Please like, share, and subscribe. Till next time. Bye. 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 -bye.